Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. So the thesis of today's talk is what, you, what can you do about taking sunlight and storing that so that you can use it when you want to. Um, and a model for that is uh, natural photosynthesis or plants, and we're going to talk about that in today's lecture. But if you want to think big picture where this all fits in, if you consider society, all of us, not just the people in this room, not even the people just in the Ann Arbor or Michigan, but all of us as a society, we are energy consumers. And we'd like to get away from the current system that we use energy and use clean technologies like fuel cells and clean fuels like hydrogen. You have to connect these pieces, but there's a piece that's really missing in terms of something that's technologically feasible. And that's that first piece. How do you get that energy from the sun into something like a chemical fuel that you could then use in a fuel cell? I'm just a kid from Iowa talking to a bunch of fellow Midwesterners. And what I want to do is talk about energy. And I don't want to presuppose anything. And I want to make sure everyone has all the information at hand to have uh, whatever conclusions you end up drawing. And so I want to talk about four questions. And I'll give you data, and you can come up with the answers. And that's first, if we're going to talk about solar energy, is there really um, a need for talking about solar energy? Is there some stu substance to the hype? Um, we're going to talk about a system that works in terms of solar energy conversion, and that's plants. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works. We're going to address the elephant in the room, and that's uh, photovoltaics. We know they exist. Is the problem already solved? And that this is no longer an avenue for science talks. And um, ultimately, I'm going to talk about systems that are being um, currently developed in my laboratory and others in terms of doing what plants do, but ultimately doing them better. And what do those look like, and how do they work? Okay. So. We're going to talk about these four questions, and so we'll start with the first one. Is there really an argument for doing or using solar energy? To talk about energy, it's important that we calibrate ourselves in terms of a common language and a common understanding. As a scientist, I like to put some sort of numbers to whatever I'm talking about, and for energy, that means you have to have some sort of unit. There's a lot of different energy units that people hear about, uh, calories, BTUs, numbers of uh, coffee cups in the morning that it takes to get you going. Those are all <laughs> units of energy. But for the purpose of this talk, I want to make sure we all have a common framework and understanding. And the energy unit that I tend to prefer is a unit of joule. And to calibrate yourself <clears throat> in terms of what a joule is, you can think about um, a light bulb and the efficient light bulbs that you're now seeing on the market that look like this on your screen. These consume about 10 joules per second when they're on. Right? That's their energy consumption rate. So when that thing is on, you're burning about 10 joules per second. For the purpose of this talk, we want to think about a bigger light bulb. <clears throat> and we want to think about what's the scale of that light bulb that we're going to be thinking about. And if you want to think about the Earth as one big light bulb, <clears throat> you can think about the total amount of energy that we burn per second. And it comes out to be about 15 trillion joules per second. That's all the energy that goes in <clears throat> into lighting the room. It goes all the energy that goes into heating your home all the energy that it takes to make the foods that you eat, and all the energy that it takes to transport people around. If you sum all that together, it comes out to be about 15 trillion joules per second. And for those of you who are interested, the energy equivalent of that is about 2,500 barrels of oil per second, is how much we burn. <clears throat> that's important because that's a scale that everything I talk about really has to be understood in. Energy is a thing that if you talk about a small scale, then it's a different set of requirements and a different set of parameters. But what I'm talking about is energy on this scale, and so that we're all clear about that. This number, 15 trillion joules per second, is important for two reasons. It's important because um, it's a record in terms of modern history. We have never used more energy than we are currently using now, and that's a fact. <clears throat> if you look at the trajectory in this plot uh, taken from this nice paper in the late 90s, in terms of our energy usage, it's just continually increased. And that's basically from a variety of reasons. We're becoming increasingly more dependent on technology. Um, the global population is increasing. And <clears throat> countries like India and China are becoming more and more industrialized. And those, the cumulative effect of all those things means that we're going to burn more energy than we are right now. And it's a fact, very likely, that within all our lifetimes, 
the amount of energy that we're using right now is the lowest it's ever going to be. It's only going to get higher. <coughs> and the trick is, or the thing to consider, is that it's getting higher at an alarming rate. If you want to have a figure of merit, if we're burning about 15 trillion joules of energy per second right now, by the year 2050, because of all those effects I mentioned, we're going to be burning about 30 trillion joules per second. Right? That's a lot of energy that we're using now and a lot of energy that we're going to need for the future. The question then becomes, where does that, where, where does that energy come from? And we all know that right now, by and large, we are addicted to fossil fuels. We got our energy mostly from oil, uh, gas, and um, natural, uh, natural reserves. And if you, brought, if you think about what are the issues associated with that, it's a very interesting topic on a lot of political and economic levels. And I am neither a politician nor an economist, so I will talk about none of those. What I can talk about <laughs> is the science behind the usage of fossil fuels. And really, it's the devil in the details in terms of the chemistry. If you think about the chemistry behind fossil fuels every time you burn them, it can all be simplified to a relatively straightforward equation. This right here, this yellow box, sums up the science behind fossil fuels. This represents what a fossil fuel is. It's a chemical compound composed of carbons and hydrogen. And they're all bonded together. <clears throat> that fuel, when you burn it, what you're literally doing is you're reacting it with oxygen. Some amount of this stuff is reacting with oxygen. And the byproduct, or the output from that, is energy. And that's the energy that drives your car. That's the energy that heats your home. One of the other byproducts of this reaction is water, which is neither a good thing nor a bad thing, but it's a byproduct. It happens. The last thing that happens inherently in terms of the chemistry of fossil fuels is that you produce CO2 as a byproduct. Now again, CO2 is a very thorny issue in terms of what exactly it does or doesn't do in our, our environment. And again, I am not qualified to really speak on that matter, and that's not really the thesis of today's talk. What I want to emphasize is that every time you burn fossil fuels, you are doing that reaction. And by definition, you're producing some amount of CO2. The more energy you burn in terms of fossil fuels, the more CO2 that you're releasing into the ambient. One important thing to know about CO2 is once you put it in the atmosphere or in the environment, it stays there. You're not going to get it back out, certainly not in any of our lifetimes. So that's a point that you have to consider or you have to think about whether you want to continue using fossil fuels to meet our current energy demand and future energy demand. We are going to produce a byproduct of CO2, and that's not going to go away. If you look at the best case scenario in terms of if we were extra efficient in terms of getting all the energy we could out of ocean waves, or all the energy we could out of wind, or all the energy that we could get out of geothermal sources. Each one of those sources individually is far less than what we're currently using right now, and it's far less than what we're going to need in the future. Right? None of those individually is going to be the answer to get rid of fossil fuels. Even if we add all these things up, unfortunately, the numbers tell you that this is not enough to meet our future energy demands, which we know is going to happen. Specifically with regards to nuclear, because that's another elephant in the room, <clears throat> the nuclear technology that we have at our disposal right now that is commercially available, that, <clears throat> that is feasible to use. Now, there's research going on in this area, and that is a separate topic. But the stuff that is available to the consumers right now, if we wanted to invest as nuclear as being the option for our energy sources, that is a possibility. But you have to consider what the cost is with that. If you wanted to get out nuclear at that level of energy, about 10 trillion joules per second, then what we are talking about is that we need to build a lot more nuclear power plants within the next few years. And we're talking immediately in the serious investment. Now, it's up to you to decide whether that's a feasible option or not, but that's the reality of it. The last option in terms of renewable energies that you could talk about is solar. Um, the sun outputs, this is a fact, the sun outputs somewhere around 120,000 trillion joules of energy every second to the face of the Earth. That's how much energy the sun is dumping to us every second. <clears throat> a conservative estimate in terms of how much that energy we could conceivably actually capture, convert, and use is somewhere on the order of about 600 trillion joules per second. It doesn't take a math PhD to realize that in terms of the numbers, there's a lot of this, and it's more than what we need right now, and it's more than what we need in the future. If you want to talk about a singular answer, solar is the, basically the only thing that we know there's enough energy out there to do. One nice thing about the sun is that it's widely available, it's free, and if we do it right, it can be very clean. How do plants use sunlight? How does that work? Leaves are nature's solar panels. They take sunlight and store that light from photons 
in the chemical bonds of fuels. So a plant will take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and rearrange things and store energy in the form of sugars or carbohydrates. It's a chemical where all that energy is stored. This is important because we know that, that life on Earth is based on photosynthesis. But quantitatively, if you want to think about how, how much that operates, estimates in terms of the amount of energy that's being converted per second by plants is somewhere on the order of 10 to 100 trillion joules per second. Again, if you think about it, that's the scale that we need to be thinking about in terms of getting rid of fossil fuels. That's very good from an optimistic perspective because there already is a system that does what we want to do, and it does it at the scale that we want to do it. If you take that plant leaf and you focus in microscopically on a little piece of that, that leaf in terms of what's it made of and how does it actually work, here's a little piece of that leaf. <clears throat> this is something called photosystem one. This is a really an amazing aggregate of uh, proteins and molecules arranged in a particular way to set up to absorb sunlight and convert that energy. And I want to describe how that operates. So this mass of molecules um, is set up in such a way that the outer ring of it is composed of these, these green rings. These are organic molecules that are dyes. They're colored. And what their function is is to absorb light. So when a photon of light from the sun hits that molecule, it absorbs that energy. And how it does that is in the following way. Come over here, Vanessa. <laughs> Uh, what you want to appreciate is these, what these molecules have, or they have, um, they have slots. They have um, basically um, little slots where they can stuff electrons. <clears throat> and there are um, slots where you can put an electron. And so for this topic of, for the purpose of this demonstration, if you want to think about it, this is a slot where you can put an electron. And so Vanessa is our electron okay. for this molecule. So sit, sit, sit in the slot. Okay. <clears throat> so when this electron is in its rest state, what that means in this molecule is that this electron is sitting in the slot that it's supposed to, and nothing's happening. Vanessa is at peace with herself and the world and the audience. <laughs> <laughs> now, what happens in terms of this diagram on the right, this uh, funny little squiggle line, these two bars, and this E and this H, what that means is that we can take this rest electron and we can excite it. And what that means is that we move it. So if you uh, believe for a second that I'm a photon, that I'm that squiggly line, what I'm going to do into this molecule is I'm going to grab this electron, invest some energy, and yank her out. Okay? And now I want you to start jumping up and down until I say okay. something. <laughs> keep going, keep going. So, so now what has happened is that I have taken energy as a photon, given it to Vanessa, now I've moved her out of her spot, and now she's an excited electron. <laughs> right? I'm getting tired. So keep going. This, this is an important point that we'll come back to you for a second. <laughs> That electron is excited, and that electron has the energy that was invested in that photon, me, in order to pull her out. And what you also want to realize is that, although this is odd, the spot where she was is now empty, and you can consider that also a charged particle. We like to call them holes. It's the absence of an electron. So really, what you're seeing here is an electron hole pair. She's an excited electron, and this is an excited hole where she used to be. Okay. What Vanessa's comment that you heard is that she's going to get tired is true. If she stays like that in an active state, she's eventually going to get exhausted, and she's eventually going to relax. So now I want you to relax, and you're going to go back to your rest state. Thanks. <laughs> so the name of the game in terms of, of solar energy conversion is to try to get that energy out of that electron hole pair before that electron gets tired and relaxes back to its ground state. Now, the way a plant does that, it has this architecture of these chlorophyll molecules, the seat that, is, uh, that Vanessa is in. And these molecules get excited, and that energy then passes from one to the other, and they try to funnel all that energy to that center point, that, that middle of this, of this complex. Right? <laughs> because plants know that it's really hard to move these electron hole pairs a long distance, because the tendency is for that electron to get tired, to relax, and recombine with the hole. Okay? A plant, what it does is that it knows that it can only move that electron hole pair maybe 10 nanometers or something on that order, max. That's about um, a, billionth of a, nan a billionth of a meter is a nanometer, a very short distance. We're talking about nearly atomic distances. Plants know that it has to use that energy somehow in some way. And so this architecture is set up so that all these excited electrons and holes get funneled into that center of that, that complex, that glob. And what happens in that complex is that energy from that electron hole pair gets pumped into to do chemistry. 
it gets injected and it, it gets used to rearrange molecules and form bonds, and that's where the energy gets stored. This is um, a non-trivial problem that nature solved a long time ago. Moving those electrons and holes that electricity <coughs> is really difficult because the tendency is, is you're going to waste that energy before you have a chance to use it. And so think about this in terms of how plants are constructed. If we look at a, a plant in terms of a tree, a tree is something that's not a billionth of a meter in size. It's something like that's 10 or 20 meters in size. The top of that tree is covered with solar panels or with leaves. And that's where that sunlight, that energy is being converted. But plants don't store, or, sorry, plants don't transport electrons from the top of the tree to the roots. That would be an inefficient process and that would never work. What plants figured out is if it's going to move that energy that it just converted, it's going to have to store it in chemicals. And so it's the chemicals from the top of that, that tree that get converted and stored and that's what gets pumped throughout this entire plant in terms of, of doing uh, energy transport. And that's an important concept that I want to I show in another example in terms of being able to get energy converted and then passing it and being able to use it in another spot. This is a set of light bulbs. Um, they're, they're really nothing more than just a panel of light bulbs. And what I have connected here are these light bulbs connected with a power supply. And there's about a cable length of um, maybe two feet max in terms of the power supply and the light bulbs. And when I flip this on, what happens is that power, electrons and holes from this power supply move through this cable, through this distance and power this light. <clears throat> and what I want everybody to do in terms of an experiment, we are doing an experiment right now. What I want everyone to make an observation of is what's the brightness of, this, of these sets of lamps because that's the thing we're going to compare or measure, okay? <clears throat> so let's, for example, say this is the brightness that we get in terms of tra transporting electrons this distance of space, okay? So all I'm doing now is I'm connecting this cable that's being strung from down here to the top. So I'm going to turn this back on and now the experiment is that these electrons now have to go all that extra distance. So, so now as scientists you are all observing the result of this experiment. Electrons are still flowing, the lamps are still on, but the intensity of that light has changed and it has dimmed. And that is your experimental handle or observation that you've lost some energy. You've lost some amount of the work that you could possibly do because you had to transport electrons all the way up to the top of the room and all the way back down to the bottom in order to get something to use. This is an example of a lossy conductor. And this is exactly the same principle that Mother Nature figured out in terms of transporting energy. It's really difficult to transport electricity long distances. You have to consider in terms of natural photosynthesis, that's a really smart observation and a really good trick that, um, that natural photosynthesis does, but it's also not the perfect system, and that's the following. So light from the sun is white light, and what that means to the layman is that it's composed of all sorts of colors. When you add all colors together, it comes to look um, like white, or, or what, that's what white is. And so sunlight from the sun is not red or green or blue, it's all of those things combined. And what I've shown here on the top screen in red, this is a plot basically of the number of photons for each color or each wavelength of light that the sun outputs to us, the Earth, okay? You can see that at each wavelength or each color, there's a different amount of number, there's a different number of photons that the sun's putting out and it has a particular spectrum or, or particular shape to it. What that plot is basically saying is white light, which that thing represents to a well, first approximation, that's sunlight. It looks white to our eye, but if we pass it through a prism so that we spread out all the component colors of it, that white light is actually composed of all these different um, wavelengths of light, all these different photons, with ha which have different energy. And what, what happens, what you have to consider in terms of natural photosynthesis, is that those dye molecules that Vanessa was demonstrating for you, they're in fact not good at absorbing all those colors of light. Um, to be technical, Chlorophyll, the molecule that's in photosystem one, it absorbs light really well in the blue region and really, really well in the red region. <clears throat> but it doesn't really catch light in that middle section. And that's a shame because actually there's a lot of photons from the sun that are there to be had. The plants were really good at absorbing all sunlight, they wouldn't look green. If a leaf was really good at its job, it would look black. And the fact that it looks green means that it misses out on all the green light, which happens to be most of the photons in terms of the visible spectrum. I've always found this ironic, but the fact that plants are green are a dead giveaway that they're in fact very inefficient in terms of converting energy. 
And that's an important point to consider because the net effect of that is that the efficiency of most plants in terms of solar to chemical conversion is, is at no greater than 3% and usually much less than that. It means that we know plants work. We know that life as we know it is based on it. Um, and the argument could be made, let's just um, grow a lot of plants and use that energy to meet all of our energy demands. And so we could do a thought experiment using the numbers from various literature sources in terms of what if, hypothetically, we took all the farmable land on the face of the earth and grew nothing but fuel plants, things like switchgrass, corn, or sugarcane, things that we could convert into a chemical fuel. Now, there are issues in terms of uh, sacrificing farmland for fuel for, uh, as opposed to food and what that would have in terms of um, feeding crises. And again, those are outside of this particular talk. But let's say, for example, we could do that and get away with that. It turns out, because of the inefficiencies of photosynthesis and the natural process, that even if you went all in, to borrow a, a phrase from poker, um, all in with growing fuel crops, you're going to only be able to produce a net of about 20% of our current energy needs. Again, that's saying that biomass is not capable, capable of being our only energy source. I want to emphasize, though, natural photosynthesis is an amazing system that we all owe our existence to. And there are four key aspects that I think we should all be aware of. Plants absorb sunlight, and we, that's a key that that's important. It seems obvious, but it has to happen. When you absorb that sunlight, you have to generate those excited electrons and holes. We have to generate a lot of excited Vanessas in order to get any energy conversion. <laughs> and not only do we have to get those electrons and hole pairs, we have to be able to move those things around to special sites where we can do useful work with them. And ultimately, if we follow natu uh, natural photosynthesis model, we have to store that energy in the form of chemical bonds. These are four aspects that I think we should all be cognizant of in this system that works, again, at the scale that we're interested in working at. You can store energy in different formats. You can store energy in the form of chemical bonds, or you could store energy in the form of solid state devices like capacitors and batteries. What I want to emphasize are what two things that I think are inherent advantages in terms of storing energy in chemicals or chemical fuels. Shown up here on the top of this slide, for those of you that aren't in the room, is a comparison of a bag of batteries, these are primary batteries, and a flask of ethanol. Um, and the energy content of these two things are exactly equal. There are roughly about 2.5 million joules of energy stored in that bag of batteries, and there's 2.5 million joules of energy stored in that flask of ethanol. That's what these are. <coughs> these are two different ways to store energy. And I leave it to you to decide which one stores energy in a more compact form. <laughs> and if anyone's interested, you're more than welcome to, after the fact, pick up this bag of batteries, which weighs about 6,000 grams, and compare that with this uh, beaker of liquid ethanol, which weighs about uh, 0.09 grams. Okay. There's also an advantage in terms of shelf life. Think about this the next time you buy a battery. If you take a look at it, there's always some sort of born on date or use by date. And what that means is, is that if you let this battery sit for too long, all bets are off of whether it's going to power your radio or whatever you want it to use it for. The lifespan that you're talking about is 5, 10, 20, 30 years. That's the sort of time scale. Think about this the next time you go to, um, to fill up your car with gas. And when you're pumping your car with gas, you're pumping it with gasoline. The energy in that gasoline and the, and the bonds in that ga gasoline molecule were put into that molecule, not yesterday, not five years ago, not 10 years ago. But in truth, if you trace it back, the energy content of that gasoline goes all the way back to the Paleozoic era, approximately, about 440 million years. That means that energy that you burn today to drive from here to home and back, it's been there for 440 million years. That's a really outstanding shelf life if you want to think about a product. <laughs> What do I want to make a point in terms of um, natural photosynthesis? Um, I'll make the analogy to um, what people were doing and thinking about about this time last century. About this time last century, people were very excited and making a lot of progress in terms of figuring out how to fly. And people were using bird wings and natural um, animals and systems as, um, as inspiration to figure out how to do this. And it, there was a lot of effort to study how bird wings worked and how they were composed and what was the physics behind how that allowed things to fly. And we learned a lot from that. 
and ultimately we were able to construct artificial devices to fly ourselves. And if you think about that though, the next time you get on a plane from here to New York or here to O'Hare, if you have to go through there, think about how your plane is put together and think about the wings on a plane. The wings on a plane have the same function as the wings on a bird, but what it's composed of and how it's put together is entirely different. Nature was an inspiration for that technology, but it was not the exact blueprint because our demands were different from what natural, or natural systems needs were. And I'll make the same point about natural photosynthesis. Plants and leaves are an, ex an excellent inspiration to say that this problem or this task can be done, but in order to do it to suit, to suit our needs, it's very likely that it's not gonna look like that. So here's um, the next thing that should pop in everyone's mind, and it's a question that we should talk about. We know that um, we can do solar energy conversion. Um, we know that technologies like solar panels exist. Um, so in truth, is there any problem left? In terms of the principle of operation, um, <coughs> It's important to understand a little bit about semiconductors. And I know that for those of you that have been a part of this lecture series this semester, you've heard Vanessa and uh, Professor Steve Forrest talk about different aspects of semiconductors. I just wanna briefly go back to concepts that I think are important in terms of this discussion. And that's um, what a semiconductor is. In layman's terms, a semiconductor is somewhere in between a pure insulator, something that doesn't <laughs> conduct electricity at all, and something that's a pure conductor like a metal. A semiconductor is very literally somewhere in between. <clears throat> a semiconductor in this context is very similar to those molecules in photosystem one that we were just talking about. And I'm going to, again, use Vanessa for this demonstration. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, so sit back for a second, and I just want to draw the analogy. So in, in a molecule, we talked about a single slot where an electron and ultimately a hole was. <clears throat> And a semiconductor is essentially very similar, except instead of having just one slot, we have multiple slots. And we have so many slots, we can think of that as being a whole aggregate. And if you really want to think about this particular demo, we can think of the following. What I call a valence band in a semiconductor is essentially a slot, a series of slots where electrons go that are all filled. If you look around yourselves, this auditorium is a really good model for a valence band where each one of you are electrons and the seats that you're sitting on are those slots where electrons could go. For those of you that are not here, um, you'll have to take my word that this is absolutely a filled auditorium and there's no empty seats. <laughs> Don't say. If you think about an auditorium that's filled in terms of capacity, you can think about this person on this end of this uh, aisle, and if they wanna move all the way over to that end of the aisle, it's very difficult. You have all these electrons in your way, and even if you get to the end of that, there's no available slot because that electron over there is sitting there. And so electrons in the valence band are not what I would consider transferable. They don't move very easily. And in that context, you can think that it's like an insulator. You don't have a lot of con conductivity. But just like in that organic molecule, the semiconductor, you can absorb energy from light, and that energy from light can excite an electron and pull it out of the auditorium, or pull it out, out of its seating. So again, we're gonna do this model where Vanessa is an electron in her excited state, but now she's in the valence band, i.e. she's a part of you guys. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be the photon, and I'm gonna pull her out. Okay, and now Vanessa is excited. She's gonna jump up and down, and she's gonna move <laughs> back and forth in front of the, of the audience. No. Yes, yes. Cool. So she's doing this now because I pulled her out, and now she has all this available space to roam. This, where she's at right now, is the conduction band. This is where electrons can go and, and be free to be happy to roam and do what they please. And she's in her excited state to be happy. Now, <laughs> keep going, keep going. No, no, keep going. <laughs> Now, you, if you want to think about this also, and this is what is, I've always thought is peculiar, but it is true. If we think again about that concept of a hole, where that electron was, this seat is now this hole where Vanessa was. But this, this particle, this hole, um, also can move just like Vanessa's doing. And I'll have Brad demonstrate that in just one concept. <laughs> so if you look at this seat, this seat is empty. This is the hole. And I'm going to have this hole move in this room. So what I'm gonna ask Brad to do, and I think he knows what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna have Brad, who's an electron in the valence band, he's gonna stay in the valence band, and he's gonna sit in that seat. 
Now that that electron that we know as Brad has moved to that slot, the empty spot is right here now. This empty spot has moved. This hole has moved in your auditorium. And in fact, I could ask this person to fill that seat, that person to fill the next seat, and this hole can move all across this auditorium. So just like, keep going, Vanessa. <laughs> just like, just like Vanessa is doing, this hole can travel all the way up and down this auditorium and is in fact very mobile. And this is an important point about uh, crystalline inorganic semiconductors, is that electrons and holes can move and they have this capacity to move long distances and they have really good mobilities. Now eventually Vanessa is going to get tired and eventually, <laughs> eventually she's going to have to relax and she's going to have to go back to her seat. But one advantage that semiconductors have over those organic molecules is that lifetime or that time that Vanessa spent looking like a mad person running back and forth is a lot longer than it is in a molecule. And so we have a better chance of getting those out and doing some useful work with them. And that's really all you have to appreciate or understand in terms of um, really knowing how a photovoltaic works. So a photovoltaic, like I'm showing up on this middle slide, looks like this. This is a commercially available silicon uh, solar panel. I think all of us have either directly or indirectly seen this. Right? And if you think about how it's put together or what it's actually composed of, we do the same thought experiment like we did with the leaf. If we focus in on one part of it, this picture in the middle is actually um, a microscopic picture of a cross section. So if we take that solar panel or that solar cell and we cut it in half, that's what it looks like. It's really no more than a slab of the semiconductor, this material, this stuff in the middle, and there are two, two contacts. There's a, a little bit of metal on top and a little bit of metal on the bottom. And those are our electrical contacts so that we can pull those electrons and holes out. And so literally what happens, this cartoon describes this actual physical picture, is that this slab of the semiconductor is just there ready to absorb light. Light gets, um, gets shined on this material and this material is thick enough so that it absorbs all the light. If it's too thin, the light's just gonna pass through. But it's thick enough that it absorbs um, that photon's energy. And where it absorbs that photon is where this electron and hole are generated physically. And the name of the game really is to get those electrons and holes out and do useful work with them before they relax or recombine. And if you use a really pure, um, very processed semiconductor, you have a good chance of getting those electrons out to these contacts and passing them through whatever circuit or load to power your toaster, or your iPod, or whatever. Right? That's how photovoltaics work. That's really the science behind photovoltaics, and this is old science. This is science that goes back really to the heyday of, of semiconductor device physics, and more or less the details have been worked out by the middle to late 70s. We know this is science that works because it's commercially available. That's always a good tip off. We know that these crystalline silicon solar cells exist and that we can buy them. We know that they're efficient. The stuff that we can buy is at least 14% efficient in terms of being able to take sunlight and converting that energy into electricity, but we can easily make uh, solar panels that are more efficient up to about 30%, I believe. <clears throat> and we know that there is some cost associated with this technology. In fact, the more efficient um, the solar panel is, the more you're going to pay for it. And we know that there's some finances associated with that, again, that relate to the economics and issues that I don't want to talk about because personally I'm very bad with my finances. What I do want everyone to realize though that there also is a cost with these sorts of crystalline solar cells that you have to be aware of and you can't deny, and that's the energy cost, right? These things, to paraphrase my dad, don't grow on trees. These things um, have to be constructed, and so you have to input some amount of energy to put them together. And if you want to think of it in layman's terms, when you turn on the solar cell and let it do its business, the first three or four years of its life are basically being spent paying back the energy that you invested to make it. And if you want to know the science behind or the details behind where all that energy that you invested, where it went, this is the accounting. So silicon, is really nice because the majority of the surface of our planet is made of silicon. But unfortunately, the rub is it's not in the form of elemental silicon, it's in the form of oxidized silicon, or SiO2, or what you might more commonly know um, is sand. Sand needs to be processed in several steps in order to look like this, an ultimate silicon photovoltaic. And what that means is there's a lot of energy intensive, high temperature chemistry steps in terms of taking that raw slag material and producing uh, high quality crystalline material that you can do work with. 
and that each one of these steps requires energy, and some of these steps very literally produce some amount of CO2. And again, all this energy that you're investing in it at this point is fossil fuels that you're burning. So you burn and you consume and you produce a lot of CO2 every time you make one of these photovoltaics. But you can think about or you can make the argument, okay, that's true, but if I just wait enough time, this solar panel is eventually going to pay itself back and from that point forward, it's going to be producing nothing but clean, free energy and I'm going to be doing something about the environment. Here is the problem with that argument. If we, again, to borrow um, a catchphrase from poker, if we decide this is something that we know how to do, the science is known, let's just do it. If we go all in and invest our resources to do nothing but building enough sol silicon, crystal, and solar panels to produce enough energy so that we can stop using fossil fuels, we can model it in terms of a simple growth model. If we assume that the silicon photovoltaic market grows at a rate of about 35% annually, which is very optimistic, which is likely not going to be the case if you factor in all other issues, but if you think that that grows at that rate um, for the next foreseeable future, sometime by, by the year 2035, we're going to have enough solar panels that we are literally converting enough energy to get rid of fossil fuels. We'll be in that 30 trillion joules per second range. And at that point, you could consider, everyone could pat themselves on the back and consider success. We've done that. The problem is you have to go back to the accounting in terms of how you got there, and that's really the details. Um, for those of you that are mathematically inclined, um, what I'm showing you in terms of a growth rate is an exponential function. And so if you want to figure out how much energy you had to get to that point, you basically have to integrate that function. And the integral of an exponential, unfortunately, is also an exponential function. Again, to get rid of the gobbledygook, what that means is you're going to have to put a lot of energy into the system. And if you do the accounting, by that year 2035, what you've actually done is you find that you're net in the hole about 30 trillion joules per second. You've spent so much energy to get that point, you're actually spending more energy than we're using right now. And because those solar panels are not yet available to you to use energy, the energy that you're using to get to that point are fossil fuels. The bottom line, again, is if you do this, you're going to actually burn a lot more fossil fuels than we're currently using, and you're going to do nothing, absolutely nothing, to lower the CO2 content in our environment. And if that was your goal, then I'm sorry, it failed. On that somber note, I want to emphasize one other aspect about photovoltaics that are important to consider, and that, that these devices are um, solar energy conversion, uh, you can go up front, solar energy conversion devices. They do not store energy. They convert sunlight into electricity, which you either use or you lose. All right, this is an obvious concept, but let's in practice demonstrate what I'm talking about. So right here, this is um, a projector lamp, which is going to model, we're going to use to simulate the sun, so I'm going to be some sort of higher power and turn the sun on. Uh, Michelle here is going to demonstrate or represent society in terms of consumers of electricity and she's got a radio and if you turn around to the back to the audience, there's no batteries powering this radio. The only power or electricity that's going to be used to generate the radio in an on state is whatever this photovoltaic um, converts from this light. And this is just a photovoltaic you can get from Radio Shack. There's no strings attached to this per se. So Michelle is going to place that photovoltaic in line. And that represents us as a consumer happily using that electricity that's generated. And as long as that sunlight is shining, as long as the sun is on, we can listen to uh, conservative talk radio until we're blue in the face. <laughs> but what happens? What happens when a cloud passes by? The power attenuates, and if I'll be a cloud, there's no sun. What happens if birds cross the path? There's no power. There's no power here that's being stored, it's just being converted. You either use it or you lose it. And we all know that sunlight doesn't last 24 hours a day. So there's a finite amount of time that we have to use electricity. This is not just a simple thought experiment. This is, in fact, the case. So take a look at data from uh, Springerville, Arizona. This is a community in uh, the southwest of the United States that uses a lot of solar energy. And it's really cool because they have a website that basically tells everything about their solar energy use. And you can go check it out. 
And they share their data, which is always a nice thing if you're a scientist. They share their data in terms of how much solar power they're getting as a function of time. And here's an example of what the data look like, I guess, for March 31st of this year. When there's no sun, before the sun rises, obviously no solar, pan solar power. When the sun rises, um, we got more and more uh, energy being converted. But that was not a continuous amount of energy that was being converted, and it was not a steady amount of energy that was being converted. At some point in this particular set of data, somewhere around 10.30 in the morning, um, the actual amount of productivity decreased, even though the sun, hypothetically, even in a very sunny state like Arizona, uh, was shining bright, something was in the way. Now, I don't know if this was clouds or birds or some other effect, but this is real data in terms of sunlight not being a continuous supply. And so if you're not doing something to regulate that or storing that energy, you are either using it or you lost it. Okay, this is data in a real system. Okay. I apologize for the doom and gloom, but I'm just presenting the facts. The last part of this talk, then, <coughs> if, if we have um, some understanding or some intuition that photovoltaics, at least the commercial crystalline silicon photovoltaic variety that we're all comfortable with, if we have some sort of intuition that that might not be the answer or the only answer, then how do we do this in a system that is an answer? How do we make a photosynthetic system? What does that look like and how does it work? So if you're going to talk about taking sunlight and storing that into energy in terms of a chemical fuel, you need to consider a, a feedstock of chemicals. So here's another thought example in terms of how one might do this. Water is a great feedstock because um, it's widely available, low cost, um, and if you know how to swim, it's not lethal. Here are two water molecules, and you could think of them being in a sea of other water molecules in a beaker of glass, but we only need to consider two water molecules. If we don't give it any energy or don't do anything to those water molecules, they're going to more or less stay like they are indefinitely. If we input some energy into the system, what we can do is we can take those water molecules and we can rearrange those atoms. We can, in my, in my language, what I would call, we can do chemistry on those water molecules and convert them into something else. So if I press this button, what you're going to see is energy being input to those water molecules and something's going to have to happen. So we input energy into the system. We can take those um, atoms, oxygen and hydrogen, and we can rearrange them. We can make or break bonds, and we can take two water molecules and make from that a molecule of oxygen and two molecules of hydrogen. We've broken bonds, and we've made new bonds. If you want to think about this from a scientific perspective in terms of a reaction, what I just showed you was we took two water molecules, we invested some energy into it, and we made those uh, new molecules, hydrogen and oxygen. And the cool thing is, is that energy didn't disappear. Right? Energy is neither created nor destroyed, it's just transferred. We invested energy into that process, and now all that energy is now buried or stored in the bonds of those products. And specifically, I want to focus on hydrogen. The energy that we just invested is now available to us and is stored in the bonds between each hydrogen atom. Right? So hydrogen is literally a fuel that we can make from water. And the cool thing about this process is if you do it, there are no byproducts of the process. <clears throat> aside from oxygen, which is relatively benign in this particular argument. Now, that overall reaction that I'm talking about, shown here, we can break it up into half reactions. And, and technically, this is the electrochemistry part of the lecture, which I'm sure no one will like. But this is, in fact, what my area of research is. Um, we can talk about when you're, when you're moving these bonds, when you're making and breaking bonds, what you're really doing are moving electrons and holes around. Okay? And if you want to be analytical in terms of what the particular electrons and holes we're doing, we can write two half reactions, which are not too important, the details of, but two half reactions that when we add these things together, it gives us this overall chemical reaction. What this means is that we can build systems to do each of these half reactions, and we can do this, what I'm showing as a cartoon in reality. So let's do that. Um, for those of you that are not here, shown on the screen is a picture of a device ultra-sophisticated for doing uh, energy conversion. Uh, this is an electrolysis cell, and for those of you in this room, uh, off to my left on the corner is this electrolysis cell set up. And what it is is uh, essentially just a, a container filled with water and two pieces of metal immersed in that water connected to a power supply. 
We're basically taking water and we're converting that and making hydrogen and oxygen, which are gases, and so they, in this context, will look like bubbles to you. What you're watching in real time, this is no funny business, you're watching energy that's being converted from this power supply and it's being stored in chemicals that you see as bubbles. And in this particular demo, we're storing this energy for a later purpose. And so all this uh, hydrogen and oxygen are being collected right now for a later um, devious use. But what you're looking at is literally energy conversion. Okay? <clears throat> and, and how does that work exactly in terms of the details or the science? If you want to break down from some pseudo quantitative um, understanding of what's going on in the system, there are two pieces of metal in water. And what I've shown here is basically a cartoon of that where these, these two long sticks, these are two pieces of metal and it's stuck in a beaker filled with water. And if there's nothing, no energy being invested in the system or if the power supply is not connected to both pieces of metal, the energy of those charge carriers or the energy of the electrons and holes in those pieces of metal are roughly the same and they're not uh, of sufficient energy to do anything. If I don't power this electrolysis cell, nothing happens. But when I flip the switch, when I connect the circuit or when I input energy into the system, what I'm literally doing is I'm putting energy so that in one piece of metal, those electrons get excited or have enough energy that they can spill over from that piece of metal and go get injected into solution to do that half reaction which ultimately results in hydrogen. And this power supply, what it's doing is it's separating these, the energy of these two pieces of metal so if I separate them enough, then at this other electrode, the holes are going to have enough energy that they can go transfer into solution to drive this half reaction and produce oxygen. And overall, I'm going to net split water into hydrogen and oxygen molecules and I'm going to convert electrical energy into chemical energy. Now, although at the surface this looks like a very clean process, ultimately you have to consider where is the energy from that power supply coming from? Well, it's being plugged ultimately uh, to a socket in the wall, which is likely getting its power from some other power plant within a 10 or 20 mile radius of here, which is probably some sort of cold uh, power plant. So really what I'm still doing is converting fossil fuel energy into another type of chemical energy. You could ar make the argument, and this is entirely true, that you could do this basically by taking that electrolysis cell and hooking it up to a separate photovoltaic, like we described, and using that electricity to drive this electrolysis cell. And that's entirely true. You can do that, and it does work. And this system, in fact, does everything that, that a plant does or a natural photosynthesis does. But I will make the argument that this is not a realistic or a feasible option, again, if you want to do energy conversion at scale. The problem with doing it this way is that you've, you have now a lot of materials that you have to invest and you have to build. And if you want to think about how much area you want to devote to doing this process and how much materials you want to invest in doing this, you actually now have two components and really three components. You have to build enough solar panels to do this, you have to build enough separate electrolyzers to do this, and you have to have enough copper wire to connect these two together. The details, which aren't too important to go into right now, but if it comes up in the question and answer session, we can go in more. But a, silicon, a single silicon solar cell actually does not have enough energy to do that water splitting reaction. That chemical reaction actually requires a considerable energy input. And if you're going to do it with only silicon solar cells, you're actually going to have to use three cells to do the job. And again, to paraphrase, paraphrase my dad, it's always a bad idea to get three people to do the job that one person could. And that's what you're doing if you're using only silicon solar cells to do this. And the last thing is to consider um, these orange wires, these copper wires. If you're going to do this at scale, you've got to have, to have a lot of conductor, a lot of copper. Right? And that becomes significant because there's only a finite amount of resources. So you have to consider whether that's a, a realistic or a feasible investment. My argument, my research, and my field of research is basically built on the premise that this is a more attractive system. This is an artificial photosynthetic system. Uh, what that means is that <coughs> this is a highly sophisticated device that is able to do everything that a plant does and in fact does it a little bit better. What this thing is that I'm showing on the screen is literally nothing more than a beaker of water with a rock on a stick that's been jabbed into it. That's all it is in its essence. Now this particular rock um, 
It's coated with some insulation so that only this face of the rock is exposed. But what this thing is, is this is a semiconductor, that's what the rock is, <clears throat> that we've stuck in solution and we're shining light on it and that light is being converted to electrons and holes and those electrons and holes are being used to convert uh, chemicals in solution, water, to produce hydrogen and oxygen. And that's the bubbles that you're seeing here. These bubbles are, again, are just like that electrolysis cell, but now it's happening at the semiconductor um, surface. This is an integrated system, again, that does everything that photosynthesis does in the natural system, but does it in a way that we can take advantage and use it. It makes a chemical fuel, which I would argue hydrogen is very useful, and it does it in a way that it's a compact integrated system that, again, in my opinion, is synthetically much easier to put together than that beautiful but very complex architecture that is natural photosynthesis. This thing now is our artificial sun. The light that's coming out of here um, is acting like sunlight. It's shining on this beaker filled with uh, slightly alkaline water, if you want to know the details. And it's hitting this semiconductor. And now this semiconductor is connected to another piece of metal in solution to complete the circuit but there's nothing else connected to it. There's no external power supply. There's nothing up my sleeve in terms of other batteries or anything connected to the system. There's nothing input to the system except light energy. And what you're watching here um, are bubbles. You're watching bubbles at the face of the semiconductor electrode being formed and coming off that electrode because the light is being shined on that electrode surface. Right? What you're watching in real time is artificial photosynthesis. You're watching light being transferred from that lamp being converted and stored into chemical bonds. In this case, you're literally watching oxygen molecules come off the surface. This is exactly what a plant does. This is actually is operating faster than a plant operates, and it's producing ultimately a fuel that's more useful. That's artificial photosynthesis. What you were watching was a semiconductor electrode, a rock stuck in a solution with light being shined on it. And if you want to use the jargon that I've described so far, what happens is these photons of light excite electrons from the semiconductor, promote it up to a conduction band, and these electrons and holes are available to do useful work. A very cool, interesting, uh, and, and very subtle process of all of this is that when you stick a, a rock or a semiconductor in solution, it has this particular property that holes, in this case, naturally get sucked to the surface of the semiconductor. This is the semiconductor in contact with water. The holes get preferentially sucked here and electrons get pushed away. And so you naturally get this separation to keep them from recombining or getting wasted, which makes it very efficient. Enough holes in this case collect at the surface before they ultimately start passing into solution and driving that redox reaction, which was making oxygen bubbles. Now these electrons that we drive away from the surface, we can collect those out the back and if we connect that to a piece of metal, which we do in this, in this particular cell, and after all this, if you want to take a look at, look at it, we can talk about it in more detail. But these electrons come with this energy and pass into this piece of metal, and now they're of significant energy that they can get injected into solution and make hydrogen, a chemical fuel. That's how this system works. The details are slightly more complex than this, but not really. You understand everything that you need to know about artificial photosynthesis. Just to go a few more details before we finish up, <coughs> this is a system that works, but to be honest, it doesn't work really well. The rock that I've chosen for this demo is strontium titanate. It's a metal oxide. It's a mineral made of uh, metal atoms and oxygen, and the orientation of the crystal structure is shown here on the left. This is a semiconductor, but it's a wide band gap semiconductor. What that means is that it takes really energetic photons to do any of this magic. It takes photons uh, on the blue end of the spectrum or on the ultraviolet uh, end of the spectrum. This is bad for a couple reasons. This is bad because if we look back again at what's the output from the sun, there's relatively few photons out here on the short wavelength end. Um, that's a good thing for us because these are the photons that give us skin cancer. These are the photons that end up doing a lot of damage in natural systems. For strontium titanate, it doesn't do anything except the work that we want it to, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of these photons as far as um, strontium titanate is concerned. And so although this particular system has been known for several decades, it's not efficient because it ultimately misses out on a lot of this light. So the area of research that I'm invested in, semiconductor photoelectrochemistry, or materials, is basically overcoming that problem. How do we make a rock that does this but does it well? 
Here's an example um, from some researchers at Penn State that were very clever. They made these rocks, these metal oxide semiconductors, they made their rocks to be uh, particularly shaped. These are bundles of, of rocks rolled into like a, a little nano scroll, so to speak. These are very small little chunks of rock. These things are like strontium titanate. They don't absorb sunlight very well. But what they were very smart about doing is they took molecules like you could find in photosynthesis, a molecule as shown up here in this corner. This is something that you can make in the lab using just benchtop chemistry. And use this as, a, as the sensitizer, as the thing that absorbs light. And the electron and hole from this molecule then gets injected into this semiconductor, into this rock, and then you can do your business of separating those electrons and holes and then generating a fuel like hydrogen. This is nice because this is an integrated system. There's no copper wires that you have to use in order to connect one thing to another. This is entirely one system that does everything a plant does but does it better. Does it do it good enough to um, save the world right now? No. <laughs> but it's getting there. The last little bit in terms of propaganda, and then I'll, I'll close, is what I do if you're interested. I'm an, I'm an electrochemist, and a lot of the projects that we do are related to solar energy, and one that I'm particularly um, interested in at the moment is trying to make bad materials behave like good materials. Um, and rather than trying to find a new material, we're trying to take a bad material like gallium phosphide, which doesn't work too well as a solar energy material, um, but has other attributes that we like. Gallium phosphide is a semiconductor that you probably haven't heard of, but probably everybody in this room uses a lot. It's the stuff that most LEDs are made out of. It's a semiconductor that's already produced and used at scale. So if you're going to think about doing this technology at a large scale, this is something that's already out there at a large scale. If you want to do the accounting, gallium and phosphorus are, again, among these more um, numerous elements or more abundant elements. The problem is, is if you make gallium phosphide in the sort of conventional solar cell design, which we talked about, for lack of a better term, it stinks. It's not good. What we do in our lab is we try to redesign how we use that material and go for unconventional designs. And this is a cartoon of one idea uh, that Michelle was actually involved in in terms of a demonstration. We took this material and rather than use just a flat slab of it, we decided to make it very spongy so it has deep trenches. And the purpose was is that this material was tall enough that photons could still get absorbed but when these electrons and holes are generated, they only have to move a very short distance before we can collect them and do useful work with them. Okay. We made the solar sponge, and this is what it looks like in the lab. This is a piece of gallium phosphide that we literally drilled holes into, so it looks like that. There are these deep trenches that extend several tens of microns in depth, and the walls of this are on the order of a few hundred nanometers, if you want to know the details. And the idea is, is that if you use this material and do nothing else to it, it actually can act like a really good material. So here's the data for those of you that are interested. This red plot is gallium phosphide used in the conventional sense. When you shine light on it, you get this sort of photocurrent response. And the only thing you have to take away from this plot is that the area under this curve represents the amount of energy from sunlight that's being converted and doing work for you. When you take the same material, though, and you make it more efficient in terms of its shape and structure, when you make it a solar sponge, this is the response that you get. Again, the only thing you have to consider in this is the area under the curve. That's how much energy is being converted by this material. We didn't invest any other energy in terms of processing it or refining it. We just made it better. Now, this is a motif that a lot of labs are working on throughout um, the United States and internationally. And there are uh, a lot of good advances being done in this particular area out at Caltech and MIT in terms of a project we can talk about afterwards. Thank you for staying awake and being here for this morning for me. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.